Hello, everybody. My name is Dawn McFadden. I'm a staff nurse here at the Boyd Hospital State Centre. Um, I have an interest in carers and befriending service and how it works. Um, I heard about compassionate communities and was keen to learn more about how that works. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about compassionate communities, or COCO as we have called it. Okay? So the Severn Hospice operate a community-based programme called Compassionate Communities, known as COCO. It's aimed at addressing an increasing problem, loneliness and isolation in an expanding elderly population. So how do they address it? At Severn, in the Severn Hospice they set up a befriending service. It's deceptively simple, but it works, and it's needed. Reports show that, and I find these reports unbelievable, a third of people over 75 who live alone typically spend 12 hours a day on their own with nobody, no contact. And one in 10 at the same group said they felt intensely lonely all the time. And I find that quite sad. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, what is befriending? So, this is quite a wordy quote, so I didn't learn it off, so I'll read it off. Mm -hmm. Okay? <laughs> so, befriend is an intervention that introduces a client with one or more individuals, which are volunteers whose aim is to provide the client with additional social support through the development of an affirming, emotional-focused relationship over time. Okay? So my overview is telling you what is Compassionate Communities and the site visit to Severn Hospice and what do we learn. What is Compassionate Communities? In a nutshell, it's a public health model that reduces loneliness and isolation. And that's really important. That is everything else I tell you, if you keep that in mind today. Okay? On our site visit to Severn Hospice, we went to we went there in October last year. Um, we spent three days there um, with the staff finding out how Coco works. We met Paul Cronin, who's the Chief Executive Officer, and Dr. Sal Ryan, who's the Clinical Commission Group Strategy, and we were involved in volunteer training. So is there a need for this? Okay. So Age and I estimate that approximately 190,000 older people feel socially isolated. Okay. This is quite an unbelievable statistic. The World Health Organization cites that loneliness can impact on a patient's health, which is considered more detriment than the effects of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That's mm -hmm. huge, mm -hmm. huge. Mm -hmm. Okay, so often this, this isolation is a result of long-term illness, death of partner, retirement, or relocation to downsize, which are all very common in this day and age. We're in a very aging society, okay, and become increasingly more aging. So the people are living longer. Currently, we have 800,000 people living with Alzheimer's, and that's expected to increase by 1 million by the year 2021. Okay? So taking you back to compassionate communities, how did it come about? Alan Kelleher, who was, the, who was a professor at community health in Middlesex University, he wrote the book Compassionate Cities, which came on to become compassionate communities, which was, what was your interpretation of it? You interpreted it how it was. Okay? Care passed care pass to professionals is unsustainable. We can't keep this going, create a brave. Mm -hmm. Okay? Communities need to respond and take responsibility for the afraid and vulnerable. Okay? To avoid crisis. And that's the whole problem, is to avoid crisis. Okay? So assessing the need. There's five areas of need. So Coco identified these five areas. Loneliness and isolation, an aging society, illness and recuperation, physical disability, and mental health. Okay? So they were asked to interpret, Severn Hospice were asked to interpret this book, okay, how would you use compassion communities for your community? So they analysed it and they thought, okay, so Paul Cronin, the Chief Executive Officer, went out to day hospice, not day hospice, day centres, okay, mm -hmm. to find out what are they looking for. So these are people who are in wheelchairs, they have oxygen, they're very ill people, they're very frail and elderly people. And he said, what one thing would increase your quality of life? What would make you feel a bit better? And he expected, he had worked in the health service for years and he thought it would be a lovely looking place for the waiting, as long as you are. The one thing that they said was, we are lonely. We want people to come and call with us. Mm -hmm. We are intensely lonely. And that's what, that's, that's the bottom line. Okay? Okay, so what are the main aims? So, in other words, what are they looking to do? Okay? <laughs> So to work in partnership with communities and development and sustaining their own supportive networks, and that's important. It's not a rocket science. It's just going back to community, go back to roots, okay? Using what you have, okay? To aim to reduce social isolation by keeping people connected with their own communities. 
campaign to mobilize skills and experience of local people with support from local agencies and to recruit and train volunteers to act as citizens' extension of the primary care multidisciplinary team. Okay? So we'll just go over some of those points, okay? So it's community development for their own network, okay? It's self-funded and self-coordinated. It's not a difficult, it's very simple in how it works. It aims to reduce isolation, but it, this is important, it doesn't do personal care. Mm -hmm. Okay? It doesn't do personal care. It doesn't utilize hospice volunteers, okay? Although our own hospice volunteers would be interested in this kind of thing, but that's not how it works. Community recruit their own volunteers with hospice input and training and supervision. Mm -hmm. And that's important, okay? So the community takes ownership of the program. It's a self-sustaining model, and I've explained that, okay? It has been implemented through engagement with local communities and the support of local agencies and services, for example, GP surgeries and community centres. The model varies from one community to another, responding to local needs and resources. Not every community will be the same. They're all different. They've got different things to offer. Okay? So you have to get in there and find out what that is. Okay? The Severn Hospice leads the initial engagement, provides two years of volunteer training and ongoing monthly reflective practice and education support. Okay. So you might ask it, what's important to you in your community? How can you support your own community? So we, this is not just beneficial to the clients, this is really beneficial to volunteers as well. Volunteers will tell us they find this really rewarding. When we met with them at Severn, they thought this was such a rewarding thing to do and they felt they were putting someone back into their community. Okay. Um, hospice works very much in the background to a more supportive role. Okay. Now, for those of us whose geography isn't great, myself included, when I realised that that was Severn, okay? So Severn Hospice covers it's a huge area, okay? Um, just to give you some idea of it, that's just a slide there. A large part of it goes into North Wales, borders Wales, a mix of urban and rural, okay? There's some isolated and some remote communities, as you can see, dotted across there, okay? So that shows the progression of the projects since the beginning of 2010 and the diagram shows the numbers trained and employed and then numbers volunteers being recruited. Okay. Now this here is how it actually works. Okay, this is a good little chart of how it works. So the medical practice identify and refer a client to the coordinator for corporate volunteers. Okay? So how you, you might say, well how do they refer them? The GP Okay, was through frail and vulnerable list. Okay, and the GP in Severn, how they used with their GP had on the computer people who were age 75 and over or who lived alone. That was their criteria, that's what they used. Okay. Um, so clients need to match with skills of one or two volunteers, an initial vis visit is organised. Okay. The type of support and frequency of contact agree between volunteer and client, and a review of ongoing support and involvement at regular intervals. And I'll just go over some of those points, okay? So the volunteer volunteer coordinator is responsible for assessing the client's needs through visit. They visit them at their home, okay? They have um, they check things like access, what access do they have? If there's maybe pets, you know, if there's volunteers, <coughs> you maybe think one of them wants to get on the house with dogs, that type of thing, okay? Um, they match clients against the skills of their registered volunteers. It's not a dating agency. It's not that type of thing. Okay, <laughs> it works very, very well. Okay, people give shared interests. Okay. So measured impact. Basically, bottom line is, does it work? Is it value for money? Does it work? So, in order to find this out, Severn Hospice realised that it's all very well people saying, "Oh, we love people coming to see us. It's great," but they have to know, does it work? Okay, so they decided to undertake an independent study by the Primary Care Trust to look at 38, patients, 38 clients six months before COPO visited and six months after. Okay, so you can see the total of home visits, total of home calls before and after. Okay, although the sample group is relatively small, the results demonstrates a marked reduction in the local health service. People's call on the local health service. Okay. It's not uncommon for, we would talk to GPs when we were there and they were saying that there were people who would come to them and because they were totally lonely, they would see to come to a GP as part of their every day. Every week they went to the GP. They had made an appointment, they went on to see the GP, they talked about the same things, they come back out again and they looked and they'd say, 
She's back over again for the set. She's taking another appointment for next week. That was loneliness. They wanted to alleviate loneliness, and they found that this fit. Okay? Now, this service, it's important to realise that this service doesn't stop people getting sick. It helps them manage their loneliness and isolation. It helps them maintain them at home in their situation. It is well documented that loneliness and isolation makes it harder for people to self-manage their, their medical care. One in six even say that they can't even get a pres prescription. That's something the volunteers would be happy to do for them. Okay? So if you look at that, home visits are down 32%. And phone calls are down 46%. Okay? And we're still measuring on the picture here. This study has further evidence of that. Okay? A and E attendance are down 50%. Emergency hospital admissions are down 35%. And doctor calls are down 36%. Okay? Paul Cronin, the chief executive, would have said to us, don't get bogged down with statistics. Okay? The important thing here is to look at the direction of travel. And it's always going down. Okay? Bear in mind that this, all this is doing is targeting loneliness. This is not hands-on care. This is just somebody sitting with somebody, somebody taking them out and bringing them back into their community. It's not rocket science, okay? So volunteer involvement. So what's a volunteer expected to do, okay? Visits were restricted to Monday to Friday. I thought was decided that that's what they did. Monday to Friday, nine to five. Normally, weekly visits of one to two hours. So that is up to the client and the volunteer to decide that among themselves, okay? Volunteers, we would find in day centre, they would come in and they'd say, I'll do five hours for you. And you're thinking, no. Mm -hmm. Pull your knees, all what you do is be <laughs> consistent. You know, jump, jump in. You're better be consistent. These are people who are vulnerable people who need you coming every week. They don't need you coming one week, we have a bunch of hours and the whole works. And then you don't say, you need somebody to be consistent. Mm -hmm. One to two hours a week is enough. Okay? You have to be consistent. That's the whole, that's very important. Okay? We'll go back just a wee second, shall we? Okay, involved this year, trips to the yard, that just put that up. It all depends on, on your environment. It depends on what the person is interested in. It could be just as much as, you know what, if you a new coffee shop, but you lovely sit down there with you for a cup of coffee. That's all. That's, it could be something as simple as that. That means the word to these people. Okay? It doesn't have to be. When I looked at that last night and I thought garden centre, many garden centres should be in Derry now, you know, we don't have that many. This was involved, this was for, you know, in England there's a lot more, like, you have to tailor to what suits your place, okay? Introduction to local hobby groups, there's loads going on, you know, they just need something given. Okay, Sharon Trainham. So the training was provided by Severus Ho Severin Hospice Trainer, who was actually a staff nurse, but that of all their education, okay? The cost was covered by the local council. The initial training was provided by trainer and local volunteer coordinator, and it was an intensive two days, and Sharon and I went on that. Okay. Ongoing monthly supervision is critical in providing guidance to volunteers and identifying potential risks. It provides a forum for finding creative solutions. Okay. So the key to the success of this program is training. If they're trained properly, it works. Okay. Areas covered would have been communication skills, boundary, confidentiality, supervision, loan worker, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> protection of vulnerable adults. Okay? It also allows a cool enough period for volunteers. Sometimes people think, mm, I don't know, I don't think it's for me. That happens, but not very often, but that allows a cool enough period. Okay? Um, sometimes when I had guest speakers speaking, um, it was time they decided that they wouldn't do first aid tra tra training because that put an expectation on people. It was just use your common sense. If you go into something and they're lying, you don't mind anything. Mm -hmm. Do what any normal sensible person would do. Okay? Um, last year, the Stephen Hospice were fee received their fund from the local council for their monthly, for their initial training and their monthly supervision reflective practice. And that's very important, the monthly supervision, okay? They meet once a month, every Wednesday, the first Wednesday of the month, and it's, they're understood that they have to come, they're asked to come, to make an effort to come, because it's very important to them, okay? Keep simple and even key. <coughs> success factors. So what makes, what makes it a success? It's community owned, good relationships and communication <coughs> with general practice, that's important. Okay, and training and ongoing supervision of volunteers, and that's vital. That is absolutely vital. Okay, most voluntary hospices exist because at some point in the past, a group of citizens felt strong enough about the quality of care to do something about it. 
Dr. Tom McGinley felt strongly about palliative care to start fundraising to build the Foyle Hospice. Okay. In conclusion, addresses loneliness as a public health issue. It has incidentally reduced clients call upon the health service. That saves a call and vital resources. That saves money. Okay. Compassionate communities almost speaks for itself. I feel very passionate about it. It's such a simple idea, but it works. It's all about community going back to our roots. Okay? It's the way things were in the good old days. Okay? Um, I would like to thank the Severn Hospice Chief Executive Paul Cohn and the staff for expertise and willingness to share it. The All Ireland Hospice and Palliative Care for Fund and Fellowship and the opportunity to get an insight into compassionate communities. Particularly Karen Charnley and Michael Conley for their support and help. I would like to thank my colleagues at Boyd Hospice for their encouragement and support, particularly Sharon Williams, who accompanied me and was pushing the buttons there today. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, thank you all for listening. Um, anybody has any questions, I'll take them later. <laughs> <laughs>